Hello and welcome to the Alt Asset Allocation Podcast. Today's interview is with Nelson Chu, who's the founder and CEO of Cadence. So Cadence is an alternative investment platform. I've known about them for, for a while now, and it's best described from their website. So Cadence is unlocking access to exclusive high yield, short term investments traditionally reserved for institutions. Earn up to 10% APY on your investment in as little as one month with a low minimum of just $500 to get started. I really enjoyed this conversation about Cadence and the private credit offerings on their platform. So private credit is a catch-all for alternative assets, not including real estate, including things like small business lending, consumer loans, factor receivables, all the things you want to get access to. This is about a $1 trillion market size and rapidly growing with about $400 billion sitting on the sidelines. So Cadence is a very interesting alternative investment platform, and I'm loving the offerings that they've been offering since their launch. Don't forget to like or subscribe to your podcast anywhere that you digest your podcast or even on YouTube. This really helps. Please enjoy this conversation with Nelson Chu. Hi, Nelson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Nice to meet you, finally. Nice to meet you as well. So I'm here with Nelson, who's CEO of Cadence, which is an alternative investment platform offering accredited investors access to short-term investments with as little as 500 bucks. So I'm really excited to have you on today and uh, talk a little bit more about this. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to share more about everything we're working on. Yeah. So as, as we were just saying before I started uh, recording, I've been following you guys for over a year now before you were even public. So it's been, it's been really awesome to see this expand and grow and excited to see what's to come. So I, I wanted to start off today just a little bit about you and your background. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I do have a traditional finance background. I think uh, going into the space, you need at least a little bit of that. Um, so I spent three years uh, at Merrill Lynch uh, for the last two months of Merrill Lynch's life. Uh, became Bank of America, so about a year and a half there. And then BlackRock, about a year there as well. Uh, so bounced around between wealth management and portfolio management and whatnot um, before I ultimately decided, you know what, this is not the life for me. I'm never going to do finance ever again. Uh, going to start my own thing and, you know, famous last words. Uh, so bounced around during the time that I quit finance to where I ultimately landed on, uh, which was launching my own strategy consulting firm, which helps startups build from the ground up. Um, so we, talent, we targeted really talented founders who usually had exited companies before uh, and uh, were working on ideas that they would, that we actually would personally be interested in investing in. And so to fit those two criteria, we'd actually work with them. So that naturally narrowed the field down from like 100 companies to like two. So we never really had that many clients at any given point in time. We kind of gave them all the resources they need to be successful. Um, these are essentially idea-based companies at that point. Uh, that's the stage that they're at. And so they could really benefit from uh, a product, a marketing, a branding, and engineering team to really accelerate and get them off the ground. Uh, that company did pretty well. Uh, we helped the clients that we worked with ended up uh, raising about $300 million in venture capital funding. Uh, so not a bad outcome out of all this. Uh, but realize that, you know, if I keep giving these founders advice on what to do and not just that, but I'm also kind of introducing them to the VCs that they're raising money from, uh, probably should be doing this myself. And that's really how Cadence came to be. So we were founded in uh, mid-2018, uh, really kind of got off the ground with our private beta in January 2019 and went live for the public in July of 2019. So it's about a bit of a full year uh, since we've been up and running. It's been a fun ride so far. What that's interesting. I didn't realize the startup uh, uh, process there. So I'm curious, I mean, it sounds like you left finance and didn't want to go into finance, but wanted your own company. And then now you're still very much within the finance realm, alternative finance, uh, a little bit different. Deep in finance now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, what, what kind of inspired you to go with something like Cadence? Well, it's funny uh, because the, the startup consulting firm that I had, uh, as much as I was trying to shy away from doing finance startups, uh, like trying to go into D2C or just other things that were trendy at the time, I kept getting inbounds from finance startups and fintech startups at the time, uh, simply because my background lent itself very well to that. Uh, we helped them with all things that they couldn't do at that point in time, like figuring out the P&L, um, helping figure out the pitch deck, uh, things like that. And so beyond just product, uh, we could help them on the financial side of things. So that naturally just kind of predisposed towards a lot of fintech startups reaching out to us. Uh, so very naturally, Cadence came to be at a point in time when, 
you know, I saw a real gap in the market in a sector that I understood at least decently well in alternative investments. Um, and that's really where we decided to say, let's put a stake in the ground. We're going to focus on, on fintech alternative investment platforms um, and, you know, rest is history. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so just giving a brief overview of Cadence, what it is you do high level. Sure. Uh, we are a fintech securitization platform for private credit. Um, so private credit uh, spans anything from small business lending to consumer loans to factor receivables. It's kind of a catch all for various different alternative assets that don't include real estate infrastructure or anything of the sort, private equity, VC, et cetera. Um, so it's, probably the fastest growing asset class in all of private markets. Um, it's got about a trillion dollars in market size at this point uh, and about 400 billion sitting in cash waiting to deploy into these opportunities. Um, and that's a really good problem to go after. If someone has $400 billion burning hole in their pocket, you should go after that market. And that's really how we, we decided to focus on this specific space. Um, the biggest challenge of private credit is really around transparency. So there's not a lot of visibility into underlying asset performance. And we thought we could actually make a change to that and fundamentally change, transform how all of that is supposed to work. Um, so Cadence was founded on the belief that we could, by providing transparency, um, visibility to underlying asset performance and attractive, innovative, securitized products or investment products, um, you can put that $400 billion to work. And we've uh, made our small dent in the universe here uh, with the first year of business with about $120 million on the retail side and about $40 million on the institutional side. Oh, I didn't realize it was that much bigger on the retail side, actually. I was thinking they were more, uh, more close. Um, interesting. So private credit, I mean, this is this is a broad growing category, right? Is there certain areas within private credit that you're uh, focusing? So you said not real estate, but that's actually kind of separate, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason why you're not focusing on that is a little bit longer term uh, maturity sort of thing, or kind yeah, of if you a, could explain long, within sure. private credit where, where you're yeah, absolutely. focusing. Uh, real estate is definitely longer term. Um, and beyond that, it's actually just really crowded. So there's a lot of different platforms out there that kind of hung their hat on real estate. And that's exactly what they want to do. And only thing they're going to do, uh, we want it to be a little bit different, offer more diversification, more optionality. Uh, and that's why we focus on the, the things that we focus on. Uh, our mantra is really as long as there are cash flows there to support uh, creating a product off of it, we can probably do it. Uh, things like small business lending, um, there's interest being paid out on a monthly, if not weekly basis or daily basis. Um, there is uh, consumer loans, same concept, um, factor receivables. There is something that's coming due that will always be paid within 30 to 45 days. We can focus on that as well. Uh, so anything that has that cash flow oriented nature to it, we can create a product around that. And that's really what we focus on. Um, geography doesn't matter. You know, we have United States, we have Colombia, we have Mexico. Uh, sector or asset class doesn't matter. We have small business lending. We have um, Amazon merchant lending. We have mobile app developer lending. So it's a really wide mix. But as long as, again, those cash flows are there, we can create a product for it. Um, and that really gives us probably the most flexibility out of any other platform out there. Yeah, and this is what really interests me about Cadence. One, I mean, I'm extremely attracted to alternative investments, but then the fact that it's so geographically diversified, all the products themselves are very diversified. So different types of cash flows, different risk spectrums on all of them, and they're all short term. So um, mm -hmm. I'm curious, why, why did you, well, what, within this private credit, what makes it so attractive to you um, to focus on it? Yeah, I think it's really what powers the, the global economy. Like you, you think like the stock market and all these public companies, you know, that's what's making the world go round. The truth is there is so much more uh, to be had on the small and mom and pop shop side of the world, right? Like this is Main Street, this is the bulk of the population of this country. Uh, so when you have the ability to give them capital, uh, in, a, in a time when banks aren't lending to them and finding ways to continue to keep the growth of the country going, that's actually really, really fun and really rewarding to be a part of. Um, we saw that during COVID at the very least, right? Uh, and during that time frame, uh, every other major institutional lender cut back. They, they cut their credit lines to these lenders. They said, we're not giving you any money. As a matter of fact, you can't extend any more loans. I, I physically bar you from doing that. And from our perspective, this is sort of where our short-term note program really shined. Uh, we have, you know, 30 day, 90 day um, investment products predominantly. Uh, so during COVID, you had a lot of cycles and turns of these products where, you know, one of them came due and then we had to reprice them, resize them. 
Uh, so in, in really volatile times, um, the short duration program helps both the lender and the investor in that instance. Um, the investor has the ability to pull money out, which they definitely did during that time frame. Um, everyone wanted cash, wanted liquidity. Uh, every dollar that wanted to come out of our platform, we let it out of our platform. Uh, there was, we didn't hold anybody up. Um, and at the same time, uh, we helped uh, lenders continue to get capital from these investors by repricing it in a way that it would be attractive enough to get capital in. So you obviously use our platform for a little bit. You should be seeing the emails about the Dutch auctions coming out. And that was going to be launched as a result of COVID. So how the Dutch auction works is basically um, at a, we come up with a range of prices that we're willing to go out to market with. It could be anywhere from 10 to 14%, for example, right? Uh, so in a normal situation, you would say, well, I'm interested in putting 10,000 at 10%, 15,000 at 11%. 20,000 at 13, uh, 12%, et cetera, and so on. And uh, if we're looking to raise, let's say a million dollars, we get enough demand for a million dollars at 11%, we're gonna go out to market at 11%. Uh, so during COVID, we saw everyone taking the high end. Like, the only way we were gonna close deals is if we hit 14% effectively. And that was the, the market clearing rate, for example. Um, but as COVID kind of settled down, as these lenders showed that they could continue to perform and deliver on these returns, the yields also started coming down. So now that benefits the lender. And so this hyper-efficient market that we've created that lets the market set the price itself allows for lenders and investors to both reap the benefits because they're kind of have, both have a seat at the table and can meet in the middle effectively. And that's something that's been really fascinating to watch. Um, but that's the only reason why, you know, to bring it back to your question, uh, we've been able to continue to power the growth of small businesses in this country um, because of what we're focused on and being able to provide capital in good times and bad. Yeah, which which always just baffles me, right? I mean, money is at an all time lowest rate. It seems very plentiful throughout the economy. So these these companies, the, the type of person that is getting money, getting these this private credit, they're denied by banks. Why why would this be the case? Yeah, generally, they don't have a big track record. Um, they don't have a lot to fall back on. There's probably not a lot of cash in their bank account to begin with to offer as collateral. There's a lot of reasons why. Uh, but the biggest reason why, honestly, is 2008, uh, the banks just pared back. They became very, very risk averse. Um, they realized they can make more money off of big companies than they could off of small companies um, and small businesses. And so, you know, if you were them, you'd say, yeah, might as well double down on things that I know I'm going to make money on. And this stuff, just let it go. Um, so that's really where the rise of non-bank lenders came in. These are fintech companies that saw an opportunity, filled that gap, and have done a really good job of it, honestly. Um, but the problem is fintech companies have the same problem. Fintech companies and fintech lenders also need to get capital from somewhere. Uh, so they source from, you know, at an early stage, like private investors, high net worth investors who are willing to take a flyer on them. Uh, they source when they get a little bit bigger from um, these credit funds that like to do this type of stuff. But again, it's still really expensive. Um, so we have been emerged as a really viable, very attractive um, alternative to everything that's out there uh, because we essentially provide capital on their terms. Um, you can, you know, there's a flexibility there with the duration of these notes, with the ability to reprice these notes uh, from the lender side that is just really, really good for them because our incentives are all aligned. We want them to grow. If they grow, then we do well, right? Um, and so they can succeed on our retail platform. They can succeed on the institutional side. They can succeed even more than that. Beyond that, that's only good for everybody uh, on board. And so we have a software, a service, or solution for every single phase of a fintech lender's growth. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, traditionally, these would be seen as too risky for banks. They're doubling down on the, the their bread and butter. So if these are too risky, uh, what can you do to help mitigate these risks? What kind of default rates do you see in these uh, these lending? Yeah, I mean, this is where uh, our short-term program uh, becomes even better, right? And it really kind of proves itself here. In addition to all the uh, transparency and the data collection that we have to help do better underwriting on our side. Um, so we have a lot of levers that we can pull. Um, during during COVID, uh, we can obviously, you know, reprice um, the notes so that uh, higher yield is commensurate with higher risk generally, right? So we want to make sure investors are aware of that. Uh, and it's going to be more expensive for these lenders, but at the very least, they can still get capital when no one else is giving it to them. Um, you can resize it. Uh, so if there's over the course of a month, for example, there's not enough um, cash flows to collateralize the opportunities that are there, we can downsize it. 
Um, so we can downsize the note, they have to pay back whatever the delta is. Um, and that again also protects investors. Um, there is the ability to restructure it. Uh, so prior to COVID, we were pretty much doing like bullet and interest only. So bullet meaning it gets paid all at once at the end, your principal and interest. Uh, interest only means that every single month you get paid uh, interest and then your principal comes back at the end. And we flipped almost everything to an amortization structure. So an amortization structure means that you'll have principal and interest paid back on a regular basis. Uh, so that was really, really good for investors to feel comfortable that, look, I'm not just waiting for all the principal to come back at the end, if that even happens, um, to have a constant steady stream of income coming in through principal and interest is very attractive to them. So those are things we can do uh, at an immediate surface level. Beneath that, it's really all about the data. Um, so you've kind of tinkered around with the platform. I would argue we're probably the most transparent out there out of any other alternative investment uh, platform uh, on the market. Um, so we, for seven out of 12 of our uh, lenders today, uh, we provide daily, if not weekly, surveillance reports around the underlying performance of the portfolio. Uh, we show you the pre-COVID vintage, the post-COVID vintage. We show you which ones are days past, how much days past due, what sector it's in. I mean, it's an unbelievable level of transparency. And beyond that, we also have um, the ability to show you every single loan in the portfolio and how it's doing. Uh, and under the asset performance tab. Uh, these are all things that uh, other platforms don't offer. And it's, you know, it, it's how we underwrite the product. So if we're comfortable with it, you should be comfortable with it as well. And we show you how we got to where we were in terms of uh, making this, this product offered to them as an investor. Uh, so these are all the things that we look at that ultimately help. Uh, at the end of the day, the bank stepped back not because um, it was too risky per se, because risk can always be mitigated. Uh, it came down to, you know, where can I make the most money and how much, is it, how much effort is it worth for me? Uh, so to do underwriting on a specific small business takes a lot of work. And so their actual margins on that are really, really low. Um, but for a fintech lender who's using technology like the latest and greatest, they have the ability to be way more efficient on that front. And they can leverage platforms like ours to also be more efficient in sourcing capital. Um, so all of that together plays well in their favor. And banks, as a result of COVID, have taken another step back in not lending anymore to this side of the market. Um, so we're going to see, I'm excited about what we're going to see coming up uh, with, again, more fintech lenders coming through. We speak to them all the time, and there's new ones popping up by the day with an innovative model uh, that does things even better than it was before. So it's all just, you know, pushing for more innovation in this space that desperately needs it. We'll have our role to play, the lenders have their role to play, uh, but all in all, it's just going to make a more efficient market that, you know, banks will probably feel bad for, for leaving, uh, but it's, you know, it's their call. Well, you can't focus on everything, right? And this is a very niche product. And like you said, it takes a lot of time to do your due diligence on these and your surveillance reports. I'll link to them in the show notes. I mean, uh, if I can, I suppose I can, but um, yeah, they're very, very extensive. So well done on that. That's for sure. What's, what's the process of, I mean, in your, in your uh, update, you said that you have 500 million plus assets available for security, securitization in the pipeline. So what does your process look like for finding these new fintech lenders? You know, what niche, what category, geography, what does that kind of look like? Yeah, I like to say that we are a VC's uh, best friend when it comes to their portfolio companies. Um, they invest a lot of these fintech lenders. Uh, it makes up a predominant part of their portfolio if they're a fintech uh, VC. Uh, and so we have the opportunity to give them the most attractive capital at a very early stage and probably the most critical period of their growth. Uh, and that has been, you know, it, it's been a great way to source good, high quality originators on that front. So VC is talking to them. Um, and also on top of that, it's good for us when we need to raise money for our next round because, you know, we've helped them so they can help us. Uh, so that works out. It's a symbiotic relationship there. Uh, but beyond that, um, we've found that the private credit market is honestly very small. Uh, you know, there's only a select group of law firms that work in the space. There's a select group of um, trustees and backup servicers and custodians, et cetera. And so when you get to be friends with them, uh, because you've done deals with them before, you leverage them as part of transactions that you do, um, they're very keen to help other clients as well. They ultimately want to be seen as adding value for their customers and their clients. So we get a lot of intros that way. Uh, and just from a pure like asset or sector basis, uh, once we go into one asset or one sector, uh, we get inundated with calls from other competitors in that sector because they're saying, well, if that person got really cheap capital and flexible capital, then I want it as well. Uh, so we have not had any shortage of trying to get originators uh, up and running and into our pipeline. Um, the challenge is in this environment, we have to be very careful uh, as to what, which ones we bring on board. Uh, so pre-COVID, we were slated to add on additional four, uh, and we really only added one. Uh, so we wanted to see 
using our technology, uh, the ability to have their portfolio stabilized during COVID before we kind of made a move. And so we've seen that uh, it's made good progress on that front. And now we're slowly but surely starting to move forward again. Um, but right now, as you saw, you know, notes closed pretty quickly. There is definitely an excess demand and not enough supply problem. It's a good problem to have, um, but we're not going to sacrifice credit quality for the sake of just getting investors on board um, because ultimately, you know, we treat every dollar that investors invest as if it was our own. Uh, so we our, our incentives are all aligned there. We want to make sure that continues to be the case. Right. And I see that you invest actually in all of your offerings as well alongside investors. So talking about eating your own dog food, which is always a good sign. Um, so I'm curious, it, it sounds like there's a, a mass supply of people looking for funding at these rates. The rates that you're offering through your platform are what, eight to 15%, probably something around there. Um, Just about. You know, yeah. So it, are these rates sustainable? Longer term, if if more and more people are, I can't. I can only imagine more uh, fintech lenders are going to be popping up. It fits in with my narrative of you know you're not getting any yield anywhere else, so you're looking in other places to put your money. Um, yeah, just touch on that if you don't mind. Yeah, it's going to be up to the Dutch auction, right? So if we have enough investors willing to take, call it, you know, 6% instead of 8%, then we'll close at a 6%. I mean, that's, you know, the, the lenders need their capital at a, a certain size. And if we can meet that size at a lower yield, then that's, um, investors are happy because those who are willing to put it at 6% are going to get it at 6% and they want to take that. And lenders are happy because they can drop their cost of capital down. Uh, so letting the, the market decide is really our, our best answer here. I will say that um, at the stage of company that we focus on, on the retail side of things, um, their alternative cost of capital is in the range of call it 16 to 20% ish, if not more. Um, so, you know, it's, we will always be better than that. Uh, but I don't think if the rest of the market is offering 16, I don't think we'll be able to offer six. Uh, so it's just, you know, it's, it's uh, supply and demand. It'll meet in the middle somewhere. And as long as we can figure out how to be a market maker in that instance, we'll have done our job. What inspired you to do the Dutch au auction? Honestly, uh, we got a lot of feedback from um, investors saying that, hey, like you guys are setting the price and, you know, the yield keeps dropping because originators are performing and they're doing well. But, you know, what if uh, I don't want to invest at this price anymore? Um, but the truth is, if there's enough people investing, interested in investing at that price, then you know, the easiest way is let the market decide at the end of the day. Um, we don't want to be the one that kind of sticks our finger in the air and says, yeah, this feels like 12% or this feels like 11% this time around. Um, if we can justifiably show the data to prove it, um, then, you know, everyone's satisfied. And, the, you know, those who aren't or don't feel like that's the right rate, there'll be other products for them to invest in as well that kind of be, that meet their criteria. Right. And you said that these, the alternatives are 16 to 19%. Where are they uh, securing this financing for these alternatives to? Yeah, there's, uh, so if they're really small, let's say they've been doing balance sheet lending for, you know, the first like six months of their life, which is very common. Um, they probably have a angel investor or high net worth family that says, yeah, I like private credit. And, you know, uh, if you want my money, I'll give it to you tomorrow, but it's going to cost you. Uh, so it's just this lack of um, transparency and lack of ability to really kind of get your offering out there in front of the broadest audience possible has limited the, their options, right? Because they want to be, they want to build their book. They want to do their day job, their actual job, rather than constantly keep fundraising for additional balance sheet capital to lend off of. Um, so these uh, individuals have the ability to take advantage of that information asymmetry and just charge them whatever they feel is right for the risk they're taking at that stage. Credit funds also invest in this type of space as well. Um, they tend to be uh, going after a little bit of a later type company or lender, um, but they're they're cheaper than call it twenty, but they're not. You know, they're still in the sixteen range. Um, and what we found is that you know, retail in general has a um, lower bar in aggregate for what they want to to get in terms of returns. Uh, and the truth is, the way we've structured it is on par, if not better, than what a credit fund would be able to structure here. Uh, we just have the ability to, because of the team that we have, do it in a much more scalable and efficient way uh, that a credit fund is hyper-focused on sourcing and diligencing and underwriting and investing. Like, they just don't have the resources to do that. Um, so we have that uh, luxury here um, that allows us to pass on these efficiencies and these savings onto investors at the end of the day. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, in a world start for yield, these uh, 10 plus percent yeah. people just salivating. And as you said, right, you throw it up and it's instantly filled up all the way. So 
a lot of these different um, products that you're offering, what's the most unique asset that you're uh, securitizing for these things? Yeah, I would say and what the ones I appreciate the most is really uh, what we like to call asset formation financing. Um, so these are uh, a very underserved part of the market, but it makes total sense. Um, so uh, oftentimes, if you're a credit facility or a bank or a fund or whatever, um, the you will only take over uh, an asset or bring the asset into the facility when it's considered fully formed or realized. So for example, um, it could be like a solar panel on the roof just as a reference point. Uh, so when there's construction being done, uh, if there is physically no panel on a roof, I cannot take that into my facility. It doesn't work because it doesn't exist as an asset. So the construction needs to reach a certain point before it's acceptable to be able to take it in. Um, so we can finance that bridge or that gap, call it like 90 days, where the homeowner has signed the lease uh, or signed the, uh, the contract for installation. Uh, the contractors have come in, they've started to build it. And then uh, once it reaches, uh, call it 75% completion, the credit facility and take it over. That's a 90 day period that not many people actually cover and the bridge. And so a lot of these lenders are actually using their balance sheet to finance that gap, even though if the panel reaches a certain percentage, it's almost guaranteed to be taken out by the facility. So the default rate is very low. Uh, and it's a really interesting opportunity and in arbitrage that, um, you know, there's just really no, uh, not a lot of people focusing on that at the moment. Uh, so, you know, we can slot ourselves in there and we like that type of esoteric, unique opportunity um, that we can make available for in, for our regular retail credit investors as well. Absolutely. So it's almost like work in progress financing kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Interesting. And then, I mean, even there's uh, there's crypto loans, which is a, a very different type of collateral, a highly yeah. volatile digital currency, you know, held custod custodied by another third party. So there's a, you have a very wide range. How do you structure your team? I mean, different due diligence groups, like this, this requires a depth of industry knowledge for each one of these placements doing the due diligence, I would imagine, right? Yeah, I think um, our team is, we're very fortunate. Um, the team is extraordinarily talented. Most of them have come from traditional finance or rating agencies or the like, um, and they can be very nimble and adaptable in these situations. Um, the truth is, uh, like I mentioned earlier, cash flows are cash flows, right? So even when you talk about crypto, um, think about it. It's, it's technically a fully, relatively fully liquid asset. Um, you have the ability to get margin calls on the way down if there's significant drops, right? Um, if they are tech enabled, which if you're in crypto, I would hope you're tech enabled, uh, you have the ability to um, kind of algorithmically and automate a lot of that manual effort that normally a, a bank would be dealing with, right? So all of that coming together means that it's, it's a standard loan, right? I mean, there's underlying collateral, which is the cryptocurrency. There is cash flows coming out of it on a monthly basis coming from interest. It's not that dissimilar at the end of the day. Um, and that's the reason how we got comfortable with it. Uh, and we really like the fact that those guys have a ton of data coming out of it that we can actually see underlying performance and all of that, that gets us comfortable with the, with the product as well. And, you know, there's been massive fluctuations on cryptocurrencies over the last call it six months or seven months or so where it dropped from 10,000 to 5,000 like Bitcoin. Um, and these lenders have a spotless record in that time frame, like no issues, nothing at all. Um, so it's one of the safest, I would argue, it's probably one of the safest asset classes out there, but a lot of people don't want to invest in crypto. And so we can give them exposure on the other side uh, through our products like this. Um, so they don't get the wild potential upswings of, of Bitcoin, but they also don't get the downswings. They just get kind of nice, steady cash flows coming out of it. Um, but our team is um, pretty much uh, heavily capital markets, um, obviously, given the, the retail and the institutional side of our business that needs coverage on both fronts. Um, a lot of engineering to kind of bolster the technology that we have and build out the various different platforms we're working on uh, and round it out by um, marketing operations uh, and executives at that point. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty well-rounded team. We're 20 now at this point. Uh, back when you were checking us out in February of last year, I think we were four. Uh, so it's been a it's been a nice run up so far. Yeah, I I think it was on your uh, quarterly report that there were only two dev devs like you know when you launched in July last year, and now you're able to fully staff up, and uh, I'm expecting big things. That's for sure. So I'm curious with all the different types of asset classes, I don't see any sort of and I may not see it. Um, is there any sort of risk scoring? on the different investment opportunities. Obviously the interest rate is indicative of 
the amount of risk you're taking, but you know, there's different term periods. So do you have some sort of, for the, the average investor that logs in, like this is a B rated risk based on these premises? Yeah, so we have internal uh, risk metrics that span well beyond just like an overall score. It goes into every single uh, various different criteria that we go through. Uh, our due diligence actually has 130 different data points that we look at to be able to get comfortable around an underlying originator and asset. Uh, we don't make it available to um, our uh, investors on the platform uh, simply because uh, the truth is if it can even go out on our platform, we stand behind it at the end of the day. Um, if it doesn't pass muster on our side, we would never let it get out. Uh, so everything is effectively the same. Um, the difference is really around sort of the um, the yield based upon you know default rates and things like that that are factored into it. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that we uh, fully believe in the underlying products we're securitizing and syndicating out, uh, which is why we haven't found a need to offer that as of yet. Um, something we can definitely look at, but uh, you know it, it's not something that we feel is pressing at the moment. Okay, that makes sense. So good transition into uh, Cadence as a whole, what you guys are doing. I mean, you're working with all of these originators, you're very selective with them. Who who else is playing within this space of securitizing, syndicating out these sort of investments uh, that yeah. you see as competitors? Sure. I mean, I think um, there is no shortage of uh, crowdfunding platforms out there for alternative investments. Um, you know, there is Yield Street, Peer Street, cadre, uh, kind of the list goes on for various different asset classes. Um, I would say that we have a, a cooler little mousetrap we got going on here. Um, so short duration investments is always a good thing. Uh, things that are one month, three months, six months uh, give investors inherent liquidity, which is always great. Um, our minimums are extraordinarily low. Uh, so it's $500. And we've seen plenty of investors put in $500 for a month, uh, get their $5 of interest back, withdraw the money to make sure the pipes work, and they do it now they do a thousand dollars and then suddenly you know three months into it they put a twenty five thousand fifty thousand dollars in onto the platform just to get because they can get comfortable with it so the ability for us to provide that level of flexibility is kind of true to our our nature you know transparency flexibility all of that stuff um so i think, think definitely on that front we compete uh with everyone else that's out there but we aim to continue to provide the most diversified offerings the most attractive products and the most optionality and transparency around the underlying assets. Uh, that's really, I think, where we can stand out. Um, beyond that, you know, as we get bigger and bigger and as we move towards the, um, the middle market side of the world, um, you know, we're competing with uh, investment banks at the end of the day who also kind of put money and find uh, investors to deploy capital into these opportunities. Um, but again, I think our ability to have tracked the underlying asset performance, um, to have done these securitizations, even if they're micro securitizations over the course of the lender's life, uh, all of that bodes well for us to be able to not just um, win the deal, but also close the deal. Uh, and that's equally as important. Uh, so I like our chances at the end of the day, but we have a pretty broad mix of competitors here that we're going up against. Uh, and the best thing we can do is um, just, you know, stay nimble, stay in a, be innovative um, and create a product people want. And at the end of the day, that will work out well for us. Yeah, very uh, uh, startup school, YC combinator, like build stuff people want. You know, it's pretty simple at the end of the day. Yeah, a lot, a lot Hard harder. To do, but pretty simple. Yeah, very, in theory, on paper, it's really easy, right? So uh, you have a number of retail and institutional investors that invest in the, the deals that you're offering. What kind of institutional investors are investing in these? Um, are you actively searching both retail and institutional? Yeah, so we did 120 million on the retail platform so far, which is what you see on our website, uh, which is our website as you see it today. Um, and that is comprised of probably 48% institutional, 52% retail capital. Um, but in terms of total numbers, like institutional numbers of investors make up less than 10%. Um, so they obviously deploy bigger tickets, um, but you know the benefit is the retail investors can invest alongside institutional investors. They um, they're treated exactly the same. There's no preference on that front. Um, so the deals they invest in are the same ones that institutionals got comfortable with, which should give them a lot of comfort as well, because they do much more thorough diligence. Um, the uh, institutional side of the world, I think we're you know having bigger ticket investors close deals quicker is always helpful. By the end of the day, if our model and mantra is democratization and providing more access, we want to make sure that retail always has a seat at the table. Um, so we are pursuing them pretty much equally, I would say. Um, but institutional is definitely the only player on the bigger ticket side when it comes to doing the full-blown 
call it, you know, rated deals that we do. Um, at that point, honestly, the yield is so low that retail is not interested um, because we're offering other stuff that is significantly more attractive and significantly more liquid um, in terms of its duration. Gotcha. And those institutional investors are family offices, hedge funds, pensions, yep. the like. Yep, exactly. Pensions are a little bit uh, way further down the line. Um, <laughs> you never know. We'll have something for them in the future. <laughs> One one day pensions will be in Bitcoin and all these all these other exactly. alternatives. You know, I'm confident. Um, so I'm curious the democratization of these uh, product offerings. Does that mean at some point in your roadmap you'd like to offer something for non-accredited investors as well? Yeah, I think um, if from a regulatory standpoint it was easier, we would have done it already. Unfortunately, um, there's definitely a lot of pains that that happen to be able to make that possible. Um, we have our eye on it. We'd love to see it. it it's definitely makes up a lot of the inquiries that we get or inbounds that we get from potential users that they you know want to make it available. Um, so on our roadmap, uh, I would say until we see significant improvement from the regulatory front in terms of just the lowering the bar to make that possible, it'll be tough for us because um, there's just a lot that needs to go into to it for the returns of effort on our side it's not necessarily worth it um but you know we're thinking about you we're working on it um and we'll, we'll see hopefully in the, in the near future uh, not an impossible thing awesome and then speaking of uh, a roadmap like what excites you over the next two years etc yeah i think um really the uh the SaaS side of our business is very exciting um so obviously right now we make a lot of our um our revenue from deal driven opportunities uh but we like i mentioned earlier we aim to provide a software service or solution for every single phase of a lender's growth right so that's really the software side of things is where we can shine um, and all that's just designed to ultimately benefit everybody involved in the transaction. It'll benefit the lender because they're more, it's more efficient for them to get capital. It'll benefit the investor. They get more of the transparency that they're looking for. And we can do it in a much more automated way than we do it today. Um, it'll benefit us because it's just going to be a lot faster for us to do what we need to do. Uh, so when we can really kind of prove that workflow from start to finish, that's when we'll say, wow, like we take a step back and say, we really did something here. That's truly remarkable. Um, that you know, no one's really done in a, in a really uh, scalable way. Yeah, I love, I love your commitment to transparency with all of that and with everything that you're doing. And I, perhaps this is a good transition into at risk of going too far down like the crypto rabbit hole, but you guys are using Ethereum. Uh, could you briefly explain how you're using a public blockchain like Ethereum? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, so there is a world where all of the securitization can be done on chain from start to finish, right? The assets get originated on chain, it gets structured on chain, invested on chain, and then ultimately settled and all that good stuff on chain. Uh, we are so far away from that being a reality simply because there are so many different transaction parties involved in a deal that they all need to buy in on it. Every single one of them. Otherwise, one break in a chain means the whole thing just doesn't work anymore. It becomes a uh, you have to now trust that counterparty. Um, so we have taken the, the step of saying, you know, we will push the envelope on transparency, on leveraging blockchain technologies without forcing anyone to adopt it. And so if you want to get the benefit of it, you can tinker with it, you can see it, you can play with it, um, but you don't actually physically need to adopt it. So how that manifests itself on our platform is that we issue a digital security, an ERC Ethereum token for every single transaction that we've ever done on the retail and institutional side. On the retail side, uh, you can see effectively how many investors invested in that deal, because it's one for one, dollar for dollar, right? You can see um, how, how much they put in, just anonymized. And you have, obviously, through Etherscan and that wallet, uh, the ability to trace every single transaction they've ever done on Cadence. So as a $25,000 investor in a $5 million deal, uh, you can go onto the Ethereum address and see that there was an investor who put in $2 million and he's inv they've invested 20 million uh, or 20 deals with us before over you know, a certain period of time. And you can get comfort in the fact that I'm investing alongside that person, right? So that level of transparency uh, around a public anonymous cap table is super powerful, we think. And it could lead toward the future where people are more interested in it, more willing to adopt it. Uh, potentially, they'd rather transact in stable coins like USDC, and then we can kind of move the ball forward. But until then, no one's asking for it, so we're not going to do it because we got to make a product people want. On the institutional side, you don't want to infinitely complicate what you have already by doing yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> exactly. On the institutional side, uh, we did a $40 million public company whole business securization rated by DBR's Morningstar for a uh, NASDAQ listed restaurant franchise. Um, very difficult deal to get over the line. It's probably one of the hardest securizations you can do. And we decided to make that our first one, uh, obviously. So that one was the first um, securitized product that had a digital asset associated with it uh, that was also rated. So it was in the DBRS Morningstar ratings report. Um, it was published on a bunch of different publications like Forbes and Global Capital and all that stuff around how unique this actually was. So this is a standard, what's called a 144A transaction. So in a 144A transaction, you actually never know how many investors are in there or how much they put in, like non-existent, no idea. You just know that a deal happened and that's kind of it. So because of what we do, uh, we created a mirrored transaction on chain as well for that. So you have the ability to see the issuer, which is the public company, uh, creating $40 million worth of securities. You have the investor with $40 million worth of cash, and you have all different counterparties involved, trustees, backup servicers, et cetera, all with their own little addresses. And the trustee has like reserve accounts they need to fill as part of the payment flow of, you know, uh, interest gets paid out, goes in that account, goes back on the investor, et cetera. So on settle and on close uh, in, in early March, you could see that the $40 million from the investor went to the trustee, went to the reserve account, and then got siphoned out and then moved over to the issuer. And you can see the securities go from the, secu the issuer to the trustee and then over to the investor as well. And it all happened kind of simultaneously. And nothing moves until it's all in the trustee's hands where they can decide what they want to do with it. And the interest is being recorded every single month as it comes through. And you can see it in the reserve account. So, and you can also see now, like I mentioned earlier, that you normally 144, you'd never know how many investors. There's only one investor who took down both tranches. Um, and you can see how much money they're making off this deal. Uh, so this is a level of transparency at the institutional level that was literally never afforded before. And we make that available as well. And again, pushing towards a future where securization can be on chain, but we're not going to force the issue until the investor is clamoring saying, I want this all to be settled on chain. It's like, okay, well, time to flip that switch and we can do that. Uh, but until then, not that much of an interest. So why don't we just add value in our own way? It doesn't require anyone else to adopt it. Really like that. I mean, Obviously, if public blockchains offer this transparency and traceability and all of these benefits, but you don't want to complicate the thing that you've got already. But I love the idea of like almost running this in parallel in the background. Mm -hmm. So at some point you can easily, yeah, yeah, we've basically been doing this the whole time. So yeah. we're just going to change it a little bit. Um, and then, you know, that offers all sorts of wild alternatives of instant settlement, instant liquidity mm -hmm. in these deals. So you, secondary markets. Um, all securities issues, obviously, but um, eventually one day, uh, some one day. very, very interesting opportunities. So I, you, you touched briefly on some of your investors. Um, it sounds like you just closed uh, an additional funding round in May. Maybe if you talk yeah. uh, briefly about those things. Yeah, we did a COVID round, which I think uh, some other people definitely were trying to do as well. Uh, so we had raised our first round of financing in January of last year uh, from a uh, very wealthy family office based in China, who I had, I had advised for, for years. Uh, but the mo probably the most notable investor in that round was uh, Argo, public insurance company. Um, and so the insurance companies are very frequent buyers of our products at the institutional level. So that's a very lo uh, logical, natural fit. And we also had Coinbase invest in us at that point in time because we were definitely much more blockchain centric at that, at that point. Um, the most recent uh, price round was in January of this year. That was led by Revel. Um, we had a lot of institutional backing at that point in the traditional finance space. So Morgan Creek, um, obviously, they have a digital asset fund and a regular hedge fund. Uh, we had um, the founder of Passport Capital, which is also another well-known hedge fund, and their family office invest through Nimble Ventures. Uh, we had Dick Parsons, former chairman of City invest. Um, and so he kind of lived this world in 08, 09 through City, uh, And he can understand the difference that we're making in terms of bringing transparency and efficiency to securitization. He really appreciated that. Um, Tuesday Capital, Generalist VC Fund based out in the Valley. Uh, and Manat, our securitization council. It's always good to have a legal counsel on your cap table. They can drop your fees. Um, and outside of that, just some strategic angels uh, that we've always wanted to get on board. Uh, so January, COVID, uh, sorry, March, COVID happened. Um, and, you know, we weren't hurting for cash. We definitely did not burn through $4 million in two months. Uh, so it was just a matter of you know, thinking to ourselves, hey, if this goes on for a while, we should probably, you know, get better capitalized. 
Um, and we were very fortunate in that the whole business securitization uh, closed in March and we were able to go out to market with a very, very um, company friendly safe note um, in May of this year, which we originally wanted only a million dollars. We were oversubscribed in three days, we upped it to 1.5, closed that out in five days. So legally we were only allowed to offer 2 million. So we settled on 2 million as our, our final amount that we raised. And in that, um, a bunch of our insiders uh, continue to put money in. So love the fact they, they believe in what we're doing to continue to support us, even though they invested in January. And we brought on board several other strategic, strategic angels that we had wanted to, again, in that round as well, that weren't available in January because we didn't have enough room. Um, so we're well positioned to take advantage of the back half of this year. Um, I'm excited for what we have to offer. There's a lot of movement happening on the retail and the institutional fronts. Um, and it's going to be a good, all in all, a good 2020. Uh, I think uh, we have returned to pre-COVID levels in terms of issuance volume. Uh, demand has never been higher. Um, and the markets are opening up again, uh, just from a liquidity standpoint. So that all bodes well in our favor At, for now. We'll see how COVID goes in the next like two months or so. But yeah. Yeah, this is being recorded mid-July or end of <laughs> July. And it's, uh, it's not looking so good. But congrats on the <laughs> round. And I, I mean, I'm... <laughs> Thank I'm you. Things will get back to some sort of normal at some mm -hmm. point. With COVID, has that drastically changed your underwriting process, your due diligence process, or are you just a little bit tighter? It sounded like you were going to bring on more originators and less now after looking post COVID. Uh, how much has that changed the process? Yeah, we've uh, we hit that 130 uh, data point mark for how we underwrite uh, very recently. So we've expanded. Uh, more and more just to be able to account for this new reality that we live in. Uh, we actually just brought on board a head of risk um, last Monday, who was the former head of ABS at DBRS Morningstar. Uh, so that was a great, fantastic hire that's going to bolster the side of our business for sure. Um, but even without him joining, we were doing a lot of things as a result of COVID to be able to react very quickly to this, this, this world. Um, and you can see it in the way we've structured it, right? So we gave ourselves enough levers at the beginning to pull to be able to protect investors. And we pulled all of them during COVID. Um, but uh, the ability for us to be able to do that is the, is the, the benefit of kind of the short duration nature of our programs. Um, so definitely tighten underwriting, definitely need more track record to uh, see how these um, companies do during something like COVID. And if you can do well in COVID, you'll do well in good times too. So that's really kind of the mantra that we're, we're, we're living by. What sort of investor for the individual side uh, is an ideal investor for Cadence Platform? Yeah, I think someone who's looking for um, diversification at the end of the day. I think uh, you know every investor should have optionality. Every investor should not be concentrated on one thing. Um, you know, sure, if you bought like you went all in on Tesla, you probably do have done really well for yourself, but it's probably not the best portfolio allocation strategy. So the ability for us to and the desire for an investor to want to diversify into things that you know generate passive income, recurring income. Um, that is always one that, that we, we love to talk to. I would say um, in terms of our user base, it's definitely people who are a little bit more savvier on the financial uh, services side of things and understand this world a little bit better. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, if they are comfortable with the fact that they can have some equities, some debt, some private debt, um, potentially even some, you know, venture investments that they want to do, like true alternatives, um, that's, a, that's a great uh, investor demographic for us. Gotcha. And it sounds like the, the interest rate is going to fluctuate with this Dutch auction. Dutch auction. That's very difficult for me to say. Uh, but the maturity term, I mean, sticking to these, these shorter, you know, max, what's the max on your platform? Four months right now? Maybe six? We did 12, uh, but oh. it's very rare. Yeah, okay. very, very rare. Uh, yeah, and we've tended to go shorter um, in light of COVID. Uh, or we bake in what's called like a call option. Uh, where the originator has the ability to call the note and then re raise more capital or raise cheaper capital or whatever it is. Um, but ultimately, it gives investors the ability to get out as well. Uh, so we do bake a call option into every single note that we have so far. Um, and people have liked that flexibility as well. But um, yeah, it's definitely during COVID, we went way shorter. Um, and then now we're starting to go longer and longer again. Okay, makes sense. And is there any liquidity before the maturity is up or you're locked in for that three-month four month, 12 month period? 
Yeah, so our competitors are looking at like three to five year lockups. Uh, and we figured if I can give you one to three month lockups, you'd be okay with that. And we've seen that definitely to be to be the case. Um, so you can't do anything with it prior to maturity, but hopefully you don't mind holding it for 30 days. Yeah, one would hope, right? Yeah, <laughs> It's a little exactly. bit different than a VC or private <laughs> equity investment. Right. <laughs> Liquidity after two months, still high percentages. Yeah. Uh, well, awesome. Um, Nelson, those are those are the questions I had. Um, where can people find out more, follow you, follow Cadence? Sure, absolutely. Uh, you can check out our website. It's uh, withcadence.io. Uh, you can always reach me. I'm happy to chat with every single one of our users and prospective users. I'm just at nelson at withcadence.io. Uh, and we're on LinkedIn, Twitter with the same, uh, same names, with Cadence. Um, so yeah, we'd love to have you check it out. And our uh, customer success team would also love to speak with you as well if you have any questions. Awesome. And I'll link all those things in the show notes, but really appreciate it, Nelson. Uh, really enjoyed this. And I personally am really interested in Cadence and I know my listeners will be as well. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me. It's great speaking with you. Thank you. There you have it. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate your support. Show notes, transcript, links, and more can be found on our website at altassetallocation.com. If you'd be so kind, please share this with anyone you think might be interested or get some value from this conversation. If you have any questions or comments, please reach out. I'm always happy to hear them. Lastly, if you're on YouTube, please like the video or subscribe to the channel. If you're listening to the audio version of this, please subscribe to the podcast and or leave a review. This really helps more people find the podcast and I really appreciate it. Thanks again and hope you have a fantastic day. Happy investing.